Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott. This is a lens that, at least on paper, is a lens that I have seen so many people ask for over the last five or so years. This is a reasonably priced, about 3,000 US dollars, which is half the price of Sigma's previous F4 version of this lens. It's a high-performing, lightweight, 500 millimeter f5.6 prime lens. The Sigma 500 millimeter f5.6 DNOS sport lens uses basically all of Sigma's latest technologies to produce what is a really fantastic telephoto lens. There are a few unfortunate realities that we will detail that are beyond their control, but if you take those things out of the equation, this is a package that Sigma has really done a great job of executing. So is this the lens that you've been waiting for? Well, let's find out all of my thoughts as we come back right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by the Phantom Duffel, a new unique convertible duffel bag that starts as a compact packable case that easily fits into your luggage or carry-on bag, but then converts into a 35 liter duffel. The exterior is made of 1680D ballistic nylon, which is tough and weatherproof. The interior has a high visibility reflective finish that allows you to easily see what's inside, even in a dim hotel room. A large foam pouch on the side has a cable pass-through to allow for charging and the removable straps use a fidlock system to easily and securely connect them. I've been using it for the gym and it has room for my water bottle, a change of clothes, a basketball, my massive shoes, a towel, and a charger for my cell phone. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check it out and use code DUSTIN20 for 20% off when you're ready to check out. So obviously one of the huge reasons why people are interested in a lens with a long focal length, 500 millimeters, and then a slightly smaller maximum aperture of just f5.6 is that the size of the lens radically changes. This lens is much shorter and much, much lighter than Sigma's previous 500 millimeter f4 lens. And just to give you an idea of the weight, it weighs in at 1,365 grams in Sony E-mount version. There's also a Leica L-mount version. So that's about 48 ounces. To give you some comparison, Sigma's own 150 to 600 millimeter sport weighs uh, 2,100 grams, making it 53% heavier. The Sony 200 to 600 is about five grams heavier than that, so roughly the same. Sigma's own 60 to 600 millimeter sport, which in my opinion is the superior lens, it weighs 2,500 grams. So it is nearly 60% heavier than what this lens is. So what that means is that if you're someone who's looking for a telephoto lens that you can take out and you can use handheld, I would say that most people are going to be capable of doing that with this lens. It really is uh, quite lightweight and it's going to basically hit you with the same kind of roughly weight um, kind of cost that a typical 70 to 200 millimeter f 2.8 lens will which is to say it's heavy you'll notice it but it's certainly manageable even for longer periods of time likewise this lens is considerably shorter than the competing telephoto zooms you can see here from the shot that it is dwarfed by the sony uh, 200 to 600 millimeter lens this prime lens from sigma is 236.6 millimeters or 9.3 inches in length and that compares to 317 millimeters or 12 and a half inches for the Sony lens. It is 107.6 millimeters or 4.2 inches in diameter. And it can, you can see it has a fairly large front filter thread of 95 millimeters. Now you'll also note that while there is that flare out to that large front element that lets lots of light in, you'll also see that the actual barrel of the lens itself is quite compact. Speaking of that barrel, this lens is made of a combination of different materials, including magnesium alloy, and then what Sigma calls TSC, or thermally stable composites, essentially high-end engineered plastics. Very nice build quality, and I will note that the lens hood itself is lightweight because they have used carbon fiber infused plastics for that. It does have that rubberized contact point at the front, which I think is really great for a lot of reasons. Number one, it's going to do a better job of absorbing uh, energy if you happen to bump into something accidentally, but also when you have that nice rubberized stable point, it makes it very natural to be able to put the lens, you know, stand it upright like this without ever doing any kind of damage to anything. And so uh, nice execution there. I'm not really convinced that this whole, you know, having to use a tension knob to attach that as opposed to bayonet style is an improvement, but that's what Sigma does on their large telephotos. By the way, this lens also does come with a very nice nylon padded case that has a carrying strap for it if, to help you with convenience for that. 
Now inside the lens, it is thoroughly weather sealed from the gasket to all the various rings and switches, buttons along the way. Everything is sealed. This is Sport Series, which gets Sigma's highest degree of build quality along with weather sealing designed to be used outdoors. This is also an extremely feature-rich lens. It has three different uh, function buttons, focus hold buttons at three different positions. So if you're holding it vertically, in different positions you have one that is you know easy to get to. Also in a first for one of their telephoto lenses, we have an aperture ring here in the front. And that aperture ring does fall in a good position where it falls easy to hand. Sigma is really doing a great job with giving you options when it comes to controlling aperture when they're so equipped. And so we have the option to either click or de-click the aperture here. We have an iris lock that'll allow you to either lock in or out of the manual aperture ring. If you're not a manual aperture ring at all, no problem, put it in A mode, engage that iris lock and it will stay there. Likewise, if you don't want to inadvertently pump into auto mode, just keep it locked into the manual uh, aperture area. So that's great. The actual uh, manual focus ring is nice and wide, has a little bit of a bevel in it. It's like ergonomically contoured, falls easily to the hand and has a nice damping to it. So that is great as well. We have a bank of four switches that comes next. There's an AF-MF switch. There's a three position focus limiter. And then there that followed by an OS control. So you have a mode one, which is your standard mode. Mode two, which is kind of panning for tracking action. And then below that, we also have a custom button that gives you two different custom options. Now, here's where the, the path diverges for Sony and Leica users. For Sony users, there is no um, you know, lens station that's available or a, a USB dock that's available. And so as a byproduct, you are going to have to just stick with the functions that are already assigned to these buttons. So what they end up being is just two additional modes for the the optical stabilizer. And so what that allows you to do is to ha have more of a, you know, focus on stabilizing the viewfinder, which by the way, seems to work pretty well for video. I can get the most stable handhelding results using that. And then the C2 position is more of a dynamic to where you basically are only getting stabilization at the moment you pull the pull the trigger, you, you hit the shutter, and outside of that, it's allowing you to track maybe more erratic action. So you have a variety of options there for what those for for optical stabilizer. Now on the Leica front, you do have access to a, a lens station or a lens dock. And so through that, you can assign different values to those custom buttons. A little bit more flexibility for Leica users on that front. Now, speaking about that optical stabilizer, this is Sigma's OS2, which uses their most recent algorithms. It is definitely an improved stabilizer over what we saw in previous lenses. They first debuted this with the 60 to 600 Sport. And so what I am finding with this is while it's rated for five stops, I was able to get, I would say, closer to six stops. And you can see in this shot that at just um, one eighth of a second, I was able to get a stable result. And I was able to get that maybe about 30, 35% of the time. And that's six stops uh, at that point. Now, again, another, another diversion is when it comes to the ability to use teleconverters. L-mount shooters will be able to use the 1.4 time and two times teleconverters from Sigma. Unfortunately on Sigma, that remains an area that is restricted by Sony. So at this point, no teleconverter support on something like my camera that I'm using here. And by the way, no, um, Sony's own teleconverters don't work. The one final thing to talk about when it comes to the build is that the tripod collar and foot here in the, when it comes to the actual tripod foot, it is ARCA compatible, which I love, means I can go right onto a tripod with it. You have a tension knob here that'll allow you to rotate it and you do have clicks at the cardinal positions. And so that is great for that. Now, when it comes to the actual removability, the collar itself cannot be removed. The foot from basically this junction on can be removed, though you will have to use the included Allen keys to do that. It is not a toolless operation. One other thing that you might note is that if you like to carry it by a tripod um, foot, there's not a ton of room in between the foot and the barrel of the lens. It's, it's fairly close and so that may not work for everyone. Overall, however, this is a beautifully built lens that is just as feature rich as really any of the Sony G Master equivalent lenses. So high marks when it comes to that. So let's talk autofocus. 
This has gotten Sigma's newest autofocus system, which they call HLA, which is high response linear actuator. So basically a high powered linear motor. It is very fast and very quiet. And as you can see here, I was able to make transitions from near to far, uh, nice and snappy. That's all great. The one area where I did notice any kind of slowdown, which is typical of any long telephoto like this, is that in some situations, if you're completely defocused, it takes a moment to actually get the lens because you can't see anything and the point of view is, or the angle of view is so narrow, can take a little bit to get kind of to it a hard edge to where autofocus will engage. So you, know, you can mess around for a split second with that. That's a pretty rare case study, however. For the most part, I found that autofocus was fast, snappy, and delivered very good accuracy. Now, for some reason, Sigma persists in always <laughs> releasing their new telephotos right in the dead of winter, which is, is difficult for someone like myself because there's not a whole lot moving out there when it's extremely cold in Ontario, Canada, where I live. And so I went out and got skunked on three or four occasions trying to find some, some birds moving around something. And unfortunately, I was unable to do that. And a lot of times I use a dog breeder nearby. And unfortunately, she was sick during my review period. So that did not work out. I did take it to the gym to try to track some um, pickup basketball. Now 500 millimeters is too long for basketball court type action. You need more space in that. It's probably better for more like stadium type sports. And so it's, it's too tight for that. Even when I was back up against the wall in the field house, probably 35 feet from the beginning of the court, and I started someone down near the end, far end of the basketball court, they still were just barely I, they weren't, I didn't have enough room to frame both their head and their feet in that shot. It's just a very long focal length. And so it wasn't great for that. And then also F5.6 in that kind of lighting is not fantastic. Uh, shooting at, you know, ISO 6400 and still only getting like one two hundredth of a second which isn't really fast enough. So that's not a great case study for it. However, you can see here that tracking was fairly good. I did note one dip away where for about five shots it out of the burst of, it was nearly 90 shots in the burst. It swung away for a moment and then came back. And so I did find just in shooting other shots that for the most part, my tracking was really good. I would say that my, I would say my, I have a lot of experience with the Sony 200 to 600 millimeter G lens, which I own. And I would say that I don't think it's still a hundred percent there, but it's very close and, you know, moving ahead. I think that it'll probably get better still when it comes to that. The one limitation that is a Sony imposed limitation like the, you know, the limitation on teleconverters is that on sports cameras like the Alpha One, which I was using for those tests, I'm limited to 15 frames per second as opposed to the 30 frames per second that the camera is capable of. And, and so obviously that's going to be even more dramatic on the new A9 Mark III. And that's a limitation that Sony has imposed on, unfortunately, all third-party lenses. Again, not Sigma's fault, but it is a reality that you have to consider. Now, there is no such limitation on Leica L mount, but unfortunately there's not really any amazing sports cameras on L mount. Probably the S5 Mark II at the moment is a about as good as it gets. And so, no, the limitation's not there, but neither is there the cameras that can really deliver everything that this lens is capable of. They don't really exist on L mount either. Now on the video side of things, I found that the video AF was good, you know, good focus transitions, confident. There is some noticeable focus breathing. Um, that's in large part due to just being such a long focal length. But uh, again, video AF worked well. Autofocus system is very, very good. Probably as good as what I've seen from any third party lens. I would still say that Sony's top telephotos are just a little bit better. So how about image quality? I will give you a detailed image quality breakdown and some comparisons in that uh, image quality breakdown that comes at the end of the video. You can jump ahead to that if you so desire. It's the uh, mark is linked in the description down below. But here is a quick breakdown and overview of that. Optical formula, 20 elements in 14 groups. That's three FLD elements, two SLD elements as a part of that makeup. I found that there was basically zero distortion, nothing that I could measure as far as distortion and vignette was incredibly low. Uh, it only gave me, a, a, I used a plus 25 to correct. So not even quite, I would say a full stop uh, vignette in the corners. This is one area where it's definitely better than any of the competing zoom lenses. Typically by 500 millimeters, the zooms have some pin cushion distortion and considerably more vignette than what you see here. 
I also found that there was no either longitudinal or lateral chromatic aberrations, no fringing that I saw in any of my shots. Extremely well controlled. And even, for example, in this shot of frost crystals that are formed on something with bright light coming right through it, there's just no fringing there. So that is an amazing performance. And when it comes to sharpness, even at f5.6, it is pretty close to perfect all across the frame. And, and you can see the breakdown later on, but it is notably sharper than either the Sigma 60 to 600, which I think is Sigma's best. Um, and then it's even better than the Sony 200 to 600 millimeter, which is an impressive performance. Comparing f5.6 to f8, I would say there is the mildest of gains at f8. After f8, Whatever gains might be there are offset by the diffraction that starts on higher resolution bodies. I tested for resolution on the A7R Mark V, which is 61 megapixels. And so after that, I mean, you can go all the way down to F32, but you're going to have a remarkably softened image by then due to the effects of diffraction. So I would say shoot at F8 if you can. And, um, you know, as a kind of a top limit, F11 being your, your upper limit if you're on a high resolution body. But you don't really need to stop down for more performance. Basically, almost all performance is available right at f5.6. Now, minimum focus distance is not amazing here. It's 3.2 meters, and so that means that our maximum magnification, you can't get super, particularly close to anything, and maximum magnification is only 0.17 times. So that is way less than the zooms, in particular Sigma's own 60 to 600 millimeter, which is really, really strong at 200 millimeters where you get a maximum magnification of like 0.44 times or something. Very high, much higher than this. So don't buy it to be a kind of a, um, a long distance macro lens. That's not its strength. I would say that the bokeh quality is nicer than the equivalent zooms at this focal length. It's just a little bit smoother and creamier in my opinion, and uh, it's certainly capable of producing some really beautiful looking images with very nice color, great contrast, lots of detail. It's fantastic optically. It even has good flare resistance. So, you know, the amount of times that you're pointing this at the sun or some kind of bright light are probably gonna be more rare because again, angle of view is so narrow, but at the same time, it does really perform well. Optically, there's nothing to complain about. There isn't really any flaw that I can point to. It's a very, very strong lens optically. So in conclusion, this is a near flawless lens in its actual performance. I would say that the Sony Tellys have just a little bit better of a focus advantage and they tend to use, you know, dual, even quad motors to get maximum performance. So I would say there's just a little bit more there than what we've got here, but this is probably gonna be good enough for just about anyone and just about any kind of circumstance. Unfortunately, on Sony, it is held back by those two major Sony-imposed third-party limitations. No teleconverters and a lower burst rate. And you're not going to be able to get around that. That's just the reality of the game. Now, on L-mount front, it is primarily held back by the fact that this is an amazing lens that really doesn't have an amazing sports camera to pair it with on L-mount. That hopefully will change in the future, and that will make this lens a really compelling buy there. The final consideration is that this lens is fantastic in its performance, and it's a little bit better than the best zoom lenses that cover this right now, but it also costs about $1,000 more than either the 60 to 600 from Sport from Sigma or Sony's own 200 to 600 um, G lens. And so you're gonna have to you know, decide whether or not that extra bit of performance and the more compact size and lighter weight is worth uh, the, the trade-off of an additional $1,000. But I will also say that this is a lens that definitely fills a need and a niche that have existed for a long time on both Sony and Leica L-mount fronts. And this is a lens that people have been asking for. Now we'll see if they're gonna go out and buy it. I'm Dustin Abbott and you'll stay tuned. I can give you the full image quality breakdown, but if you want more information, you can find buying links in the description down below and also linkage to both my full text review and also to an image gallery if you wanna see more from it. And now without further ado, let's dive into our detailed image quality breakdown. Okay, let's start by taking a look at vignette and distortion. You'll be excused if you don't see much difference between the image on the left and the image on the right. 
You can see that there is so little distortion that I didn't see anything worth correcting. And vignette is actually so low that I only used a plus 25 to correct for it. And so there's very moderately less vignette that shows up there. But really, there is almost nothing to correct for when it comes to vignette and distortion. This is an area where it definitely exceeds all of the zoom lenses that cover 500 millimeters that I've tested. Now this image really shows how well uh, longitudinal chromatic aberrations are controlled. That's the fringing before and after the plane of focus. So you can see both before and after plane of focus here. And we can see that even with these, you know, the, they're just frost ice crystals that have formed with the sun coming very directionally through them. Lots of potential for fringing here. And you can just see that there is nothing to be seen. It's really, really well controlled. Likewise, in this image where we would see maybe some lateral chromatic aberrations, you see this house down near the edge of the frame. Now you can see that there's some heat shimmer that has affected textures, but you don't see any fringing. If we move up here, pan through the trees, and we look up here near the edges of the frame, there's just no lateral chromatic aberrations to be seen. Just lots of great, great detail. So that's another impressive performance. Now, using a 61 megapixel Sony a7R Mark V here, uh, looking at f5.6, this is 200% magnification. And you can see at this very high magnification level, the detail is just incredible in the center of the frame. Looking at the mid frame, if anything in this zone, I would say it almost looks better, extremely, extremely crisp. And looking down here into the corner, that sharpness profile just carries right into the corner. And it's not just that corner. If I look up at the opposite side, you can see an identical result, very well centered, very, very high performing. So to put that in, in context, now these, these two comparisons were not shot at the exact same time, but under similar conditions. You can see compared to the uh, right at near 500 millimeters on the 60 to 600 millimeter sport, you can see here in the middle of the frame that the, the prime lens has a clear advantage over the zoom lens. You can see in all of these textures, there's just so much more contrast and detail. Likewise, if we move into this zone, that result becomes even more noticeably different. The prime just looks fairly soft by comparison. Now, I think that the prime does, a f or excuse me, the zoom lens does a fairly good job in the corner of the frame, but the prime lens clearly has more contrast and detail uh, either way. And if you look up here, you can see that the textures are just popping in a way that they don't with the zoom lens. So a clear win for the 500 millimeter DN over the 60 to 600 millimeter. Now I have consistently found uh, Sony's own 200 to 600 millimeter to be really better than just about anything that I've tested for the zoom lenses. But you can see that this prime lens from Sigma has a clear advantage over it in the center of the frame. You'll note also to get equivalent framing, I had to zoom into 518 millimeters. These were shot at the same time. I had to zoom into 518 millimeters to get equivalent framing. In the mid frame, again, a clear advantage for the zoom, or excuse me, for the prime lens. And then here looking into the corner, you can see once again, the prime has the clear advantage and that's true in both corners. So an easy win there for the prime lens. Now taking that into a real world image, we can see here as we look at the horse that there is just great detail and contrast in all of the, the fine hairs. And if you look along the shaggy coat here, right on out, I mean, look how incredibly sharp it is even right there. Just a little bit of softening here towards the very edge of the frame, but it's not far off. That's a fantastic performance. Now, if we compare f5.6 on the left to f8 on the right, you can see that, truth be told, there really isn't any kind of noticeable improvement as you stop the lens down a bit. Uh, all things considered, things are more similar than different. So I see so you're getting pretty much maximum performance wide open. There's just not really any kind of advantage I can point to stopping down to f8. Now from f8 to f11, you can see that diffraction is taking away just a little bit of the contrast already, and that's only going to increase as you continue to stop things down. If we compare f11, which we could already see was a little bit softer than f8, and then you know a little bit softer still from f5.6, and we compare it to the minimum aperture of f32, you can see here that we have lost a lot due to diffraction. The lens still looks pretty fantastic at f11, which does bode well for using even a two times teleconverter on Leica. Uh, L mount, but you can see that if you go beyond that, diffraction on a high resolution body in particular is really going to soften image quality. Now, as noted before, 
there's nothing to write home about when it comes to the amount of magnification that's available right under 0.17 times. You can see that up close performance is good. There's no problem there. I have no complaints when it comes to that. At its worst, the 60 to 600 millimeter produces this amount of magnification. And at its best, it can g give you this kind of magnification. So, and, and again, if you go even to 60 millimeters, it gives you this kind of magnification. So clearly there's much more flexibility when it comes to getting up close and working with the 60 to 600 millimeter zoom lens. This image here, I think, really shows off how nice the bokeh quality is. Just really smooth and creamy out of focus background. This shot here, again, it's a little bit further away, but it shows just how nice the background is. Likewise, in this shot, which is you know maybe a more typical working distance if you're shooting with like wildlife. Uh, at this point, I was probably about 70 feet away from the horse here. You can see that even at that distance, it's able to blur out a background really quite nicely. And even in this shot, where there is a really complicated background that is right beyond the horse. You can see that there is a little bit of jitteriness there, but not bad. And then you look beyond that and you can see that the background looks really soft and creamy. So I would say bokeh quality is definitely going to trump what we're going to see from any of the comparative zoom lenses. One th final thing we'll look at is flare resistance. Again, you're not going to be pointing this lens at into a bright light source very often, but what I saw was a continued holding up of contrast and uh, in various positions, you can see there's no weird ghosting artifacts or um, just big veiling impact. It holds up and basically all the metrics that I can test, this lens passes all the tests with flying colors. And as always, thanks to those of you who have stuck around to the very end. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Let the light in.